Fintech Chatter TV. Presented by Tier 1 People. Leaders in Fintech Executive Search. Hi, I'm David. I'm Ethan. And we're from Fundable, the funding solution with no dilution. Effectively, we're here to help founders grow their business and scale. If they have subscription revenue, we help you turn your monthly recurring revenue into an upfront annual advance to grow your business. So effectively, we monetize a business's recurring revenue contracts and provide up to 12 months of their revenue upfront instead of waiting to receive it either weekly or monthly. So we allow businesses to do exactly that on attractive terms. There's no other hidden fees or goodies. Effectively, it's a fixed discount on your annual contracted value, which you can then use to scale and grow your business. Our capital is fast. We can get your money into your hands within the week, sometimes in as little as 48 hours. Welcome to FinTech Chatter, the show where I invite guests from the FinTech community to share their stories of entrepreneurship, growing the business, scaling, hiring, and all the other stuff that goes on into starting a startup. Today, I'm joined by David and Ethan from Fundable. Welcome to the show, chaps. Thanks for having us. Great to be here. I'm really pleased to have you because um, what's been really interesting since we started showcasing this next wave of Aussie kind of fintechs is um, it's becoming really apparent that many are, are deciding to move away from the traditional funding model of coming up with an idea, putting together a pitch deck, and then going and trying to raise capital from VC you know, high net worth investors. So would you be able to, David, share with us a little bit more about this problem that you're solving? Absolutely. I mean, as I, as I think you've covered it a little bit in your intro, but, but that's really it. When you're starting out a business or when you're growing a business, you need to raise capital to keep going. Um, and as a result, you often have to give away parts of your business in return. And I think there's definitely a place for that. I think VC is a very important part of the ecosystem. They bring a lot of contacts and information and help and support to founders. But I don't think raising capital every single time should involve giving up a piece of your business. Mm. That's very, very expensive and problematic depending on where you are. So we believe that the problem that needs to be solved is having additional funding opportunities for founders and, and business owners to grow their businesses without having to dilute. So we're the funding solution with no dilution, there to be something alongside your other capital options when you're growing and getting some success and you just need a little bit more runway or some capital for the future. I'm just hearing the ra radio jingle now, with the funding solution with no dilution. <laughs> Genius. <laughs> Ethan, how did you come up with the idea? What were the, what's the background to it? Yeah, well, there were, it's actually those two main sources of inspiration. So in my previous role, I sat on the investment committee looking at early stage investment opportunities. And I remember one, it was a rainy Tuesday afternoon and um, two, two founders had come to our offices and they were obviously looking to raise capital and they were raising capital but looking to give away 40, it could have been 45% of its business. And albeit I was sitting on the other side of the table, I, I, I felt sorry for these founders because without this capital injection, they probably wouldn't have been able to keep on doing its business. They, weren't, they didn't have any sort of track record or um, they weren't profitable, of course, and they couldn't secure bank debts or any sort of funding on attractive terms. So it was the all equity route or unfortunately it was closing up shop. So I kept on thinking that there had to be a more founder friendly funding solution for these, for these businesses. Um, and so the second source of inspiration was I had actually told my previous employers that I was um, resigning to work on another business idea. So I took some time off and I actually went up the coast. And whilst I was working on the business idea, which is completely different to, to Fundable, it was in the influencer marketer space. Um, I, um, there was a, I had a personal investment in a software business that had just declared that they were looking to raise um, equity funds, um, which was a little bit disappointing because they weren't able to control their cash burn and they were raising prior to when they had forecast, um, which resulted in myself um, being um, further diluted. And obviously they didn't hit their milestones to attract that, that valuation that they were heading towards. So I thought to myself, this business, they've got contracts with the likes of AXA, Microsoft, Brookfield, these large conglomerates, three, five years out, that 
It doesn't seem like they're going anywhere. Mm. What if you're able to bring forward some of those contracts, extend this business's cash runway, improve its recurring revenues, raise at a high valuation and get less diluted and everyone's very happy. So um, I guess, yeah, there was a few reasons for, for starting up Fundable, but mm. it was definitely a, a staged event. So have, having been in, you know, kind of own businesses and small businesses for I think two and a half decades now, um, I remember we, we, we used to have invoice factoring, which was, you know, you had an invoice, you'd kind of sell that to the bank, they'd take a proportion of that and you'd get the money up front. How is fundable different to say invoice factoring? It's, it's a great question. I think there are a couple of key points in invoice factoring that are a little different in our model. The first is when you're invoice factoring, you've already provided the service and you build the customer to pay you for it. So it's effectively a debt that's owing and you can then factor it by selling it to someone else and saying, hey, give me money up front and then you can collect from this party when they eventually pay. Mm -hmm. But there's no, there's no concern that the, the services have been delivered and someone owes you money for something they've bought. Yeah. In our case, what we're actually saying is if you have subscription revenue, revenue from your customers. We believe that if we look at the metrics of your business, we can determine how sticky that revenue is. Right. And so we might be saying, we will fund you against subscription revenue that we expect in the future based on your track record and your performance, but it's not actually guaranteed. Mm. So your customers can cancel a month to month basis, but we'll actually fund you on the assumption that they actually won't right. because it's so sticky. So then I guess the, the you know, the, the kind of type of, of customer startup that you're earning, uh, aiming for is somebody that has a product that's out there generating revenue that customers are, are using. Absolutely. This product, right? Absolutely. Right. If, if there's nothing for us to have a look at and get comfortable, it's a little bit early. Yeah. What we want to see is that you're, you've got product market fit and a bit of traction. Yeah. Customers are buying your product and they like it. And then we can then extrapolate and say, this is a great product and a great team. People are going to continue to buy it and really going to stay with you for the journey. Awesome. So how did, how did you guys get together? Uh, that, that's a great story. There's a great story to it. So there, there um, always is. Yeah, there's always the is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a best friend of mine, he actually used to work for Dave. And I remember one afternoon him giving me a call and saying, Hey, Ethan, um, you wouldn't quite believe it, but my, my boss, he's actually looking for something earlier staged. He's, um, he's a reputable guy. He's, he's a lovely guy. Um, and it's worth giving yeah. him a and shout. And then he introduced you to David, eh? So to David. And <laughs> I was a bit disappointed, but yeah, it was exactly. too late. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess the rest is history. Um, so yeah, it always seems to work out that mm. way. Mm. So where's Fundable at now? How, how long has the business been going and, and how many people have you got in the business? Yeah, well, um, Ethan's idea was about a year ago, but I think he, as you can hear, he percolated on it and there was a bit of sort of thinking mm. and refining before I think he was ready that this is now sort of germinated into a kernel of an idea. Yeah, I joined up with Ethan when I left my previous role and we launched the business six months ago officially. And we spent the first couple of months just getting our process and our product refined mm. and also decided we needed to raise capital. We wanted to be in a position that when we opened the doors, we could deliver for customers. Yeah. If they wanted funding, we wanted to be there to support yeah. them. So so we spent the first three months back end of last year getting that in place, raised capital from EG funds. And so now we're in a position where we've launched the business and we're officially out there, you know, supporting awesome. customers. So we've got our first pioneer customers. Um, they're all sort of going really well. Um, one of our favorite stories is a customer we funded in uh, February and doubled revenues in March on the back of some of the expansion wow. that they did. So that makes us feel yeah. really great about what we're actually doing. Yeah. So validation then for the, the model. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So um, I guess, you know, it, it's early days, but what would you say have been some of the, the kind of biggest challenges that you've faced so far in getting fundable off the ground? Um, I mean, I'll start and maybe you can talk a bit mm. about, you know, the, the product itself. But, you know, one of the big challenges is track record in all things. We're mm. looking for track record in our clients to make sure we can fund them. And equally, stakeholders of our business are looking for track record in us. And that always creates this catch-22. Yeah. You know, people say to you, we're very excited. We want to get on board. How have you been doing? And we sort of say, well, we're getting started. This is what's going to happen. And there's always that challenge with yeah. the imagination. If, yeah. Will it actually happen? So that was a big challenge of, you know, getting that, getting off the ground. People had to have faith in us that this yeah. would work. It's a novel product and it wasn't really functioning in Australia this way. Well, I guess, you know, and it's, this is, again, one of the kind of great things about the podcast is going back to early stage startups as we're kind of back to innovation, you know, doing things that 
I'm being done before. How did you, Ethan, get people to to invest in 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 yourselves and and sell the vision? Was you know, did you go to a particular type of investor, or like, did you just how how did you go about doing that? Yeah, so we were very, um, we we were very um, focused on getting the right strategic investor on board right. that can help us not just from a potential capital standpoint from a longevity um, piece but also being able to actively support whether that be through introductions a platform in terms of mm. um, in-house resourcing um, so it, it the, the process took a little bit longer than we anticipated it always does cost more and and takes longer than you budget for um, but we're very excited to have eg funds as our cornerstone investor um, they're incredibly value aligned and they also add a lot of um, intrinsic value to the business mm. alongside um, the capital that they've provided. Um, and as you've kind of got the capital challenges around getting customers, how, how have you gone about doing that? Uh, from, from the capital standpoint, I guess as any fintech, there's always a challenge in terms yeah. of raising too much and too little and being yeah. able to support and we're also a startup ourselves, so we yeah. also go through those capital challenges. I wish we could fund our, our capital, but unfortunately we don't have that nature to our revenue stream. Um, in terms of the client side of things, um, being incredibly receptive, um, I guess when we do meet with clients, the, generally the answer is we get, we get it, we understand the needs, um, we'd love to onboard. There's no cost or commitment to onboard with us. Mm -hmm. um, effectively, we provide them with a trading limit that they can utilize for their business when, they, when that falls due. Um, so they've been very receptive to the idea. Um, the other response we're generally getting is, yep, get the idea, love the model. Mm -hmm. Not quite for us at this moment, but would love to touch base in a couple months yeah. time um, when we're looking for a little bit more of a funding yeah. source to bolster distribution efforts or to extend runway or they're heading towards a, a capital raise and they want to hit yeah. their milestones. Well, that, that's, sorry, a, yeah. that's a great thing about our product is fundamentally we're approaching clients to say, we're offering you something that is actually a solution for you. And that's, that's when they come back to us and say either not now or yes, please. Yeah. And so we don't actually have any negative, nev negative responses where people say we would never want that or yeah. we don't like that. It's sometimes just we've got a lot of capital raised already or we're almost profitable, so maybe in the future. So that's really great for mm. us because we know that we'll be able to help them along their journey throughout. Yeah. The other thing is obviously the startup and, 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 and growth community in Australia is really, really close. And so as long as you have the customer at heart and really trying to do the right thing at all times, there's a lot of positive externalities mm. in the community to bring clients to us that sort of make that match for us. What was that moment like when you got your first client? Magical. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was magical, seriously. Um, incredibly rewarding as well, as Dave mentioned. I mean, one of our initial pioneer clients have managed to double their revenues yeah. in the space of one month of accepting our funding source. So um, I guess we're a team of very passionate um, supporters of the Australian tech ecosystem. Mm. And it's incredibly rewarding to see already some of the success stories yeah. and um, yeah, looking forward to growing with our clients. But I'm sure like all things, that moment when you take the theory and the practice yeah. into reality is just so unbelievably cool because, you know, you talk about it ad nauseum, days, nights, mm. weekends, the should work, people should want it, this is how it will happen. Yeah. And then when it actually does happen, it's like a little bit surprising yeah. but also Euphoria. just, you know, amazing. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and look, I think one of the things that I really like about what you're doing mm. and, and how you're going about this is you're very much the kind of lean startup approach to just get the product out into the hands of customers and let them validate your idea rather than, you know, surveys and all this other stuff that people just tell you what you want to hear, right? That's exactly right. I mean, we can we can go out and blow the bugle about how great our yeah. product is, but if our client can say that for themselves, then it's yeah, that, that's the best validation yeah. you can really give. But that's, the, you know, you have to, uh, it's a very sort of common saying out there these days, it's almost a cliche, but if you're not embarrassed about version 1.0 of your product, you're mm. probably too late. I think we definitely subscribe to that thinking. The reality is um, our product does have the features we think resonate. And at the end of the day, customers are going to tell us what they like and don't yeah. like. And it's up to us to then quickly adapt and make sure that we refine our, our product. So you guys first-time founders or... 
Have you had a stab at the Vayner founder in the past? I'm a first time founder. Uh, this is my second sort of official go around. My previous role was at a non-bank lender called Credible. Right. And I was there at the beginning when we, we started up that business. That was also a niche focused capital solution mm. actually to the medical profession. And so I learned a lot about how to focus narrowly on making sure that your product fits your clientele. And obviously customer service is at the heart of it. Yeah. A lot of people said to us, how will you compete with other more established options out there? And the, the reality is as long as you look after your client at all times, Times, that really is a big competitive advantage. Yeah. Um, what advice have you got for first-time founders? I guess, look, you've, you've done it now, right? So you're, kind of, you're one of the very few that now are kind of legitimately can, can provide advice. Um, what would you say is the thing that you've learned the most on this journey so far, Ethan? Um, I probably have two pieces of advice for founders. One being there's generally a more optimal capital stack for for your business um i think the all equity funding routes is yeah. very much past our days and um firstly in terms of raising an alternative funding source and maintaining your equity is also providing a vote of confidence not just for your investors but also for your internal stakeholders employees mm. that you'll be there for the for the long yeah. run and you won't lose your incentive and you won't lose control of your business and just become an employee themselves um Another piece of advice I, I, I generally give to founders is that I, not to be too fixated on the valuation, but choose the capital source that will best support your business and will mm. grow with you. Um, I guess how we provide our, um, our funding source to our clients is we're very much in it to grow with our clients. As they grow, we want to grow with them and, and increase their limits and increase their funding opportunities mm. through Fundable. Um, so not to be too fixated on the valuation, choose the preferred capital partner yeah. that you can grow with. Yeah. And David, what, what, what advice have you got for other founders that are, or people that are thinking about going out and Absolutely. launching a startup? There's so many considerations, but I think a really important thing that helps me is to think about it as a marathon and not a sprint. Mm. Like Ethan said, if you think short term or wins and losses, uh, it's very easy to lose sight of whether you're actually succeeding. So I think having the, the stamina and to try and stay balanced through the very volatile ride you're going to go on is really important. Mm. I think the, the highs are really high. The lows can be much lower than normal traditional style corporate jobs where there's a lot more stability. So I think being able to take those sort of knocks on the chin with 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 perspective and understanding it's all part of the process really really helps you have that stamina to get to the other side mm. now ethan we were at the fintech australia meetup last night i think i got asked about eight times by people if i could help help them hire and find developers and engineers yeah <laughs> it's not our, it's not our thing you know or customer success managers or whatever it's not our thing but obviously you know the the challenge for talent is is a real one. How is Fundable gone about bringing in the caliber of people that you you know absolutely essential to get something like this off the ground and and become successful? Firstly, how cool was that that catch up last yeah, night? Yeah, it was really nice, nice to finally all be in person yeah. and. Yeah, meet face to face um, rather than these Zooms and Teams calls. I think we've all had enough of that. Yeah. But yeah, definitely agree. There's definitely a tech crunch out there. In terms of how we generally approach our our, our talents and um, what we look for when we do look to hire, it's definitely looking for um, individuals that are hungry, humble, and and people smart. We're also working in a very fast paced and agile space. So looking for individuals that relish the challenge, the uncertainty mm. of building something that's, that's great and um, being in it for the long run yeah. and is able to um, execute in those difficult times. Now, of course, if you ask anybody whether they relish a challenge, I don't think I've ever met anybody who turns around and says no, right? How do you assess, David, you know, people who ha actually have those qualities versus thinking that they have them or just stating that they have them? That's a, it's a really good, for? it's a really great question. I think we really have moved away from the concept of show us your resume, tick boxes on experience, and then try and extrapolate that into our business. The way we've sort of done it is, first of all, we want to get to know you. So we mm. try and spend time with potential candidates outside of the office, sometimes outside of business. Yeah. You know, we've caught up with people over lunch. We've caught up with them over sporting yeah. events. At, at, and, and basically, that's a natural environment yeah. where you can get some of that sort of authenticity. The other thing that we 
try and do is we, we're sort of quite good about it. I think in terms of the, the continuum, I think we know there's certain confidential things in our business, but at the end of the day, our product isn't supposed to be a secret. So we've oftentimes said to people, if you're interested in potentially working with Fundable, come hang out with us. Yeah. We're an authentic group of people. Come spend time in the office, look at what we're doing, show up at some of the events we go to and see mm. what we do. And that allows us almost to try it before you yeah. buy it for both sides. Yeah. People then can then know exactly what they're potentially interviewing yeah. for and we can get a flavor for does this person fit culturally do they really relish the challenge mm. like you said and do they do they come alive in the various environments we find yeah. ourselves in but i actually had this very same discussion maybe about three weeks back uk dit they invited me to a breakfast they had leaders you know fintech leaders from the uk australia and talent was the number one discussion and they asked my opinion was a kind of talent expert there and I, I basically said exactly what you've just said there, David, which is, you know, the process that most businesses have for hiring was developed over a hundred years ago in the Great Depression, when you had literally lines a mile long of people with resumes begging for a job. And we still have the same process, right? Mm -hmm. There is not a mile of people <laughs> begging for a job out there. And I used the analogy of a date, right? Imagine going on a date and somebody sat there with a clipboard saying, uh, can you give me an example of when you've split up with someone? <laughs> how have That's you dealt exactly with, right. how have you That's dealt exactly with, so right. you found somebody's been cheating with you? Would um, you ever yeah, cheat? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then um, how much money do you earn? Can I have the names and numbers of two, yet, two of your exes? And uh, by the way, if I'm interested, we'll do this again. I'll bring along a mate and we'll ask the same yeah. questions. <laughs> and then after that, we'll move in together. <laughs> You'd be like, you wouldn't be going on the second date, right? <laughs> so what you've said there about that process, I absolutely, you know, I've been saying this for the last five years. It has to be this almost kind of courtship. Absolutely. You know, relationship. That's what you're entering into is a relationship, right? And the strength of an organization is the strength of its relationships. And that point on relationships is a really applicable one for our stage of the business. Mm. It's a really intimate relationship. There's a huge yeah. reliance on the core team, yeah. on each other yeah. to make things happen. It isn't a case of a big organization where there's layers of, of support and backup yeah. if somebody sort of is enabled. Mm. Yeah. And so for us, there is this absolute trust that almost transcends just getting mm. a task done, that we need to have absolute confidence in yeah. each other. And I think you've kind of touched there on the reason why most people fail when they move from a corporate straight to a startup is there's layers of protection on there. There's nowhere to hide. And you're going to make a lot of mistakes. Absolutely. And unfortunately, in a big corporate, when you make a mistake, right, your kind of badge gets marked. You know, you don't get the promotion. You don't get the bonus. So you kind of, your natural instinct is to either hide it or blame someone else, right? <laughs> and I think you get very, very good people come into the, the environment of a startup and it's just, it's too much. It, it's too much. And I think it's often a case of the right person, just the wrong time of the business. That's exactly right. I think everybody, like you said, the answer is yes. Do you like risk? Do you like uncertainty? Yeah. Do you like a challenge? Yes. Yeah. But when you actually feel what that feels like, yeah. when you look around and there's nobody with the answer, I think that's, yeah. that's a real big realization. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's been times for you, Ethan, where you've thought, what have I got myself into? Yeah, well, welcome to the the, the land of startups. It's, yeah. a, it's an absolute roller coaster, as Dave said. You 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 have your highs and you it's this feeling of euphoria, and but your lows they're they're tough. Mm. Um, but I it's you have to think that there's a much more longer term play, and mm. um, it's it's riding the wave. When you when you look at kind of culture and and values, you talked there about you know your investors earlier and them sharing the same values. What are what are the things that are important to you? In, in your organization and, and the, the things that you, you know, and the behaviors that you really value? Yeah, well, definitely based on what we've been speaking already is, well, relationships really matter to mm. us. Um, they, they matter most. Um, and I think it's definitely a value that we instill within the, the culture is coming to work with a, a feeling of purpose and wanting to do something greater than the, that than yourself and hopefully yep supporting the ecosystem supporting supporting each yeah. other and um also also a culture of having fun just in general yeah. um there's a lot of ping pong and and good fun in the office so um yeah from a value perspective it's all about relationships whether that be with our clients whether that be with our with each other with our partners 
with our investors. Mm. Relationships really sit at our core. And what, what are the important things for you, David? I think that in addition to what Ethan sort of touched on, I think integrity and support are sort of two concepts that are really important culturally for us. So integrity is a really personal thing. You know, it's, people interpret that different ways. Yeah. So I think what integrity means for fundable needs to be coherent and consistent. Mm. And I think that's really important because we're dealing with finances and money. We're able to, we're getting very, very sensitive data from our clients on their business. They're really trusting us with a really important decision in their own business. Mm. And equally for us, you know, everybody who's in the business is, you know, effectively has their hands on the till and the keys. So we need to believe that everyone, if you ask them the same question about sort of ethics and behavior, would answer it yeah. the same way if we're in a different room. One of the things I'm I learned when I was at business school from a really, really great entrepreneurial professor. He said, there's sort of three questions that you need to have here. And when you get into business with someone, it's not important what the answer to the question is. It's just that you would answer it the same way. And one of the things, his first question I remember was, it was an amazing question. He said, you're at a big corporate, you're in charge of the money, and you've just been paid by a really, really big client. Let's call it, you know, Apple or GM. And they've paid you $100,382. And you know that that's for a specific invoice because it's such a specific amount. And three days later, you get another hundred thousand dollars, three hundred eighty-two, and you know that they've double paid you. You also know it's a small amount, and you know that nobody will ever know because they're a huge organization, you're a huge organization, and you've been double paid. But what this will mean is that your business is going to hit some milestones. People will get bonuses, and it'll be a great outcome. What do you do? Mm. And and everyone was like, oh, well, of course you need to return the money. And he said, it's not about what you think is the right answer. It's just that if what you would do is the same as what your partner or your other colleagues would do, you're in a culturally aligned place. Yeah. And so I think we all know what the correct answer we think is for that question. Yeah. But it's those kind of things that you can really come to mm. see that you're with people who are heading in the same direction as you. Yeah, I've got to stop myself here because we're, we're going to go down a rabbit hole. Right? <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> because it, I absolutely agree. And I think um, you know, there's even a lot of scientific research out there that will show that if you get people who will say, yeah, that's how I am in, integrity wise, once they see one person get away with it, it's it's, it's unravels right. very yeah, quickly, yeah. Mm -hmm. and I think it's such a uh, you know it's such a powerful kind of um, you know lesson on leadership is that you know whatever the CEO kind of tolerates, the leadership tolerates determines the culture, absolutely. not the the words that you've said and the values. Mm -hmm. So. I think that's an absolutely incredible example, I think. So. And look, for me, you know, putting it into actual practice, the moment that I knew that Ethan and I had that alignment yeah. and we could therefore instill it in our organization was Ethan showed up to one of our earlier meetings. He was a little bit frazzled. I said, what's going on? He said, well, I was driving along on the way here and I clipped somebody's side mirror. And, you know, that was very upsetting. So I said, oh, well, what did you do? He said, well, I got out the car and I looked at the side mirror really carefully. I looked at my side mirror and I couldn't see a scratch. And I was like, oh, that's very lucky. That's wonderful. And he said, yeah, but I just, you know, I was in a hurry and I wasn't sure. So I wrote my name and put it on the guy's windscreen and yeah. just said, here's my number. I've hit your mirror. I don't see any issues, but if there is, please call me and yeah. we'll sort it out. And the guy actually called him and said, thank you so much for being yeah. honest. Let's have a beer. But in that moment, I'm hearing from somebody, someone who's chosen to do the right thing with no requirement, the, the universe and the world would never know otherwise, yeah. much like that this, the, that mm. example I gave earlier. And that for me was putting into practice, here's a person yeah. whose integrity aligns with my own and I can trust. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, we were talking about ecosystem very briefly, um, but I want to talk about that a bit more. And it's, there's a couple of things that I want to kind of cover, which is, first of all, as I mentioned, you know, we're, we're showcasing earlier stage startups on the podcast this year. What's been really refreshing for me is if I think back to last year, pretty much everybody who wanted to be on the podcast was doing another BNPL, you know, BNPL for recruitment fees, BNPL for home loans, which I thought were mortgages. <laughs> but, uh, right, but it, it, was, it was just, I, I couldn't take it anymore. And uh, yeah, what's been really refreshing to go back to kind of real early stage startups has been... You know, that, that kind of return to innovation, right? Where we were with Afterpay and Zip five, six years ago, um, what was really kind of, and, and, you know, you guys are an example of this. What I'm really excited about is how now we're finally having the kind of credit models tipped upside down and it's creating new products because in FinTech, we've not really seen new products. 
seen a lot of kind of innovation to make things fast. That's like a cheaper to, to deliver, but we haven't really seen new products. Um, what's what's your sense, first of all, Ethan, as to you know where you think we're at here in Australia with, with in terms of innovation? I might ask Dave to if you want to. Yeah, look, I think in terms of innovation, I think there's a lot of innovation in the startup community. If we sort of move it straight into fintech and sort of apply mm -hmm. it to our space, there's a lot of innovation as well. But I moved here from the States um, where I was living previously, and I remember being struck, this was 10 years ago, with there's a lot going on, a lot of parallels here in Australia, but some of the things just felt a little bit behind where yeah. I just come from. And then I started to see things like Afterpay and Zip and see people bringing models that weren't essentially brand new. I mean, yeah. you, you, I heard about it all the time. It's just lay by. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it was innovative because of the way they applied a concept. Yeah. And I think that's now really starting to happen in, in a more structured way. Like you said, instead of just saying, oh, well, BNPL is great, let's BNPL something else. People are looking and saying, what isn't being done well? Is there a whole group or an industry mm. that's being left behind or underserved? And how can we do that better? And I think that's now really starting yeah. to happen in a big way. Mm. I think there is still a bit of a lag, some of the other markets, but, but that's yeah. really great to see. Yeah. I think what kind of excites me about the approach that you guys have got, and you know, I think we're going to start to see this apply to things like home loans. Um, I mean, particularly for consumer debt, where you know we we can't rely now on people having a job for life, and you absolutely, know, they, they, you know, people are working four days a week, three days a week. People are doing six month stints somewhere. People are having their own business. People are going out and being influencers. Mm. Yet the you know, credit models are all based on somebody having a regular job and a regular income. Um, what I really like about your model is, you know, you've gone, hey, we're going to look at the propensity to fulfill, you know, the, the, the kind of the debt, right? Mm -hmm. And looking forward rather than looking historically. Mm -hmm. how, how have you gone about doing that? Because obviously that then requires a different model. That requires, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, you're going to have to get access to data that, you know, isn't just there with a credit agency. How, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, well, you're right. Effectively, we're creating a, a new asset class yeah. as a fixed income-like product that's yeah. effectively securitized off the back of a recurring nature to a, a revenue stream. Um, in terms of the our credit engine in the background, we're, we're looking at a, a variety of metrics um, to be able to underwrite our clients. Mm. Um, and um, it, it's interesting you say, as in we're, we're taking it, the actual model itself, it's nascent. However, it's still applying similar sort of practices that have been used for many other many other types of business. Mm. So if you're looking to underwrite a, 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 a software business, as an example, there's yeah. generally your 15, 20 odd metrics that you yeah. would use to um, look at a SaaS business that we're, of course, using. But I think it's applying a different sort of mindset yeah. to to looking at these sort of businesses rather than those that are heading towards the ground, but rather they've got the ability to really grow and scale. Mm. I think I think your your point is right. It's certain other you know credit models said you need to have a job for life, and then we just look at three paychecks and extrapolate yeah. that. Yeah, and then that really worked for a long time because yeah. that's how the world functioned. We're not sort of saying don't have a paycheck now and we'll still lend to you. Yeah. We're saying, like you said, maybe that paycheck or that income stream looks different, yeah. but is actually in the same risk band as what we used to think something else was. So th that's what we sort of looked at. We said a recurring revenue stream from clients that are very credit worthy with a sticky product has inherent value. Mm. And we can try and look at metrics around that and say, are we going to be able to advance capital against this in a, in a safe way? Mm -hmm. And so what is required is looking at traditional methods of calculating things, but applying different weightings yeah. and different value on performance uh, according to our understanding yeah. of what a good business in our space looks mm -hmm. like. And I think, like you said, a lot of the traditional models out there haven't been updated yeah. for how businesses today look and feel. And so there's a vast swath of companies out there that don't look risk uh, don't look yeah. um, safe, but in actual fact, if you really dig in, you can see there are ways to provide yeah. credit in a way that isn't going to yeah. blow blow everyone up. And it, it, you know, as you pointed out, right, you you could have AI doing that same thing, but without the context, 
it then becomes really dangerous, right? Because yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It does what you tell it yeah. to do, right? So at some point, someone's got to say, what do we want it to look at and what do we want it to tell us based on what it finds? And and because ours is new, we're effectively looking at it and saying, instead of looking at three paychecks and extrapolating out, look at this revenue contract, find these other items and then extrapolate yeah. that. So there's a lot of sort of uh, investment from our perspective in understanding the types of clients we're doing to make sure we can sort of mm. tweak it to be accurate. So, Ethan, um, other than the free return to free pizza and <laughs> beer, what's got you excited about the Aussie fintech scene right now? Um, well, there's definitely been some incredible businesses out there that are definitely taking a stance on on it within the ecosystem. And but I might just share one business that's definitely well, two businesses that have definitely caught my attention and got me the most excited, yeah. which are which you might think is quite humorous in a way, um, which is piping cap chase overseas, um, which have very similar models to us. Um, but it's been quite exciting on our end to just see the the take up that's been um, that's been taken up by by businesses um, in those US markets. Yeah. So Pipe as an example, they've already onboarded 8,000 odds clients onto its platform. They were the fastest growing fintech globally to hit yeah. unicorn status. So for us, it's very much proved a point that we've always known that is recurring contracts are very valuable and that they should be tradable. Yeah, And it's provided us with validation that um, what we're working towards is very exciting as Australia generally they albeit a smaller market it works in tandem to mm. overseas markets which is very encouraging for for us yeah um what about yourself David what's got you excited right now I think the ecosystem around us developing rapidly is also really exciting. So, you know, when we looked at setting up our business, we looked at traditional models of providing a financial product and said, well, what do you need? And the reality is now there's so many great fintechs all around different problems yeah. that can actually work with us and help us. So, for example, when we looked at our compliance function and said to ourselves, how are we going to make sure we do this correctly? Before you might have thought, can I have, do I have someone with a comp compliance expertise or who's going to read the mm. regulations? Now they're fintechs that are amazing at actually helping us do the, what we need to do from yeah. a compliance perspective. And instead of um, needing to go and sort of upskill ourselves in something that's not our core skill set, we're able to work with them, partner with them and, and, and sort mm. of work that way. And that extends beyond just compliance. It's the way our payments work, the way our capital flows. We're dealing with a number of service providers who themselves are fintechs yeah. growing on the same kind of uh, space as us. And it's really, really nice to see that we're all kind of symbiotic. Yeah. You know, they, they're supporting uh, credit providers and we're, we're one of their customers. And, and the most rewarding about it all is some Sometimes it almost flips on its head. We go to them and say, hey, we need some help with whether it's compliance or payments or whatever. Can you explain your product? We understand their product better. We become a client of theirs. Mm. Then we realize actually we're, we're providing them with recurring income. Yeah, and so you know the virtuous most recent circle, the yeah. virtuous circle. Yeah. Ethan turned around to one of our service providers and said, hey, you know you guys look like you're growing really fast and you've got a lot of recurring revenue. We know we're not going anywhere. We think your product's great. Do you need any funding? Yeah. And they've turned around and said, well, what do you mean? And so, you know, some <laughs> yeah. of our earliest clients were actually uh, catch-ups around just networking or us buying their product. Mm. And they turned into customers where yeah. they said to us, actually, we're thinking of raising. Maybe we could get some fundable product. And they hadn't thought about it mm. until we engaged. And that's really exciting. Ways to work together by yeah. just, you know, solving similar problems in a similar yeah. space. That's fantastic. Really fantastic. And you know what I love about it is small businesses can have a big impact. You know, and we're starting to see now the network effects mm. of technology being the leveler, right? And those people who, you know, have a great idea and are willing you know, and committed to executing on it. Mm. will be successful right like this i, I think we're actually going to see a massive you know if the stats are nine out of ten startups fail i think we're going to see that number shrink 
Absolutely. I, I yeah. said the same thing to Ethan the other day. I said, you know, the reality is that that stat probably includes um, periods from before where people had a great idea, had mm. great traction, had great skills, but ran into parts of their process or their growth that they didn't have those skills for and it was people solved. Yeah. And so if you couldn't find people to come and help you solve that problem, your business was in trouble. Yeah. Whereas now if you just understand technology and em embrace what's out there, oftentimes you can create a solution yeah. that's a bit of a hybrid. Awesome. Where can people find out more about Fundable? Well, you can head on to our website, fundable.com. Um, but also... Is that, let's show the T-shirts that <laughs> No E. <laughs> yeah, no E. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Um, well, actually, this is relatively old merch and about two <laughs> weeks or so we'll be rebranding which is very exciting but otherwise i'd yeah. encourage people to you know get in touch with us ethan yeah. in particular is always available ethan at fundable.com yeah. or you know give him give him a ring yeah. we'd love to talk about the business to anyone who's interested whether that's a customer a partner or stakeholder um, and we you know we're so passionate about it yeah. we're available at any time so that's always a nice yeah. way to engage cool yeah. and look we have some seriously talented people listen to this show as well who never know might be interested in joining something like Fundable, what's the best way for people to reach out to you? Via email, LinkedIn, um, give me a call. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're, we're like, we're, I think yeah. it's, it's pretty standard these days. We're hiring. So, yeah. um, you know, we were always out there looking for talent, trying to engage with people, whether it's for roles that we have open now or in the future as we grow. So we're really excited to connect and LinkedIn and email is a really good way to just get in touch with us through the website. And we'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Well, chaps, it's been great to have you on the show. Folks, um, show your support for Fundable and all the other great shop startups that we're showcasing on FinTech Chatter by giving us a like and subscribe. Until the next show, stay safe. Fintech Chatter TV. Presented by Tier One People. Leaders in Fintech Executive Search.